Okay, it's going to be a review of WWF Fully Loaded 2000. This has got to be my pick for, you know, possibly the best July uh, pay-per-view that the WWE has ever done. And, uh, yeah, I would say without a doubt that this double main event, it's got to be in contention for best double main event in WWE history. And it's possibly my favorite pay-per-view of 2000. I know, I know 2000's got some really, really good ones from the non, you know, big five pay-per-views. You know, Backlash was really good. Fully Loaded is incredible. SummerSlam might have been better from top to bottom. But I, I think this double main event, at least in the year 2000, it, it's got to be the best double main event of that year. So, and, and when we're looking at July pay-per-views, you know, it, it, it's tough. I, I think this does have some competition. You know, they started out with doing the In Your House pay-per-views. I think In Your House Canadian Stampede, it's definitely a candidate for best July pay-per-view ever. And then uh, eventually July became a fully loaded uh, show from 98 to... 2000 so this is this is by far the best fully loaded I, th I think that they've done i don't think that's uh uh debatable and obviously you got the invasion which i just reviewed for the 20th anniversary and uh then then it became vengeance and i think vengeance 2003 from uh the f the first smackdown pay-per-view i would definitely say that's got to be in contention then it became like a great american bash pay-per-view from like 2000 i want to say 2004 Five through like maybe 2008 and then I think it became Night of Champions and then like from 2010 until I guess now they kind of flip-flop between Money in the Bank and Extreme Rules you know most of the time you know July was a Money in the Bank pay-per-view but then you, obviously you got Money in the Bank 2011 most people might consider that the uh, the best July pay-per-view when I think about it but but yeah man th this has definitely got to be in contention uh, fully loaded 2000 and, uh, and it's funny I'm looking at the cover right here and you got Stone Cold Steve Austin on the cover. And uh, Austin had not come back from uh, neck surgery yet. He didn't come back until Unforgiven. So, you know, I guess this is one of those situations where they, they wanted Austin return to return for Dallas, Texas. You know, this would have been a great time for him to, to come back. But uh, that did not happen. Uh, 420,000 pay-per-view buys. Uh, not a bad buy rate at all. So, uh, so we're at Dallas, Texas, July 23rd, 2000. At this time, I probably didn't even know who Chris Benoit or Chris Jericho was at that time. But um, but I would definitely say this, like, uh, that that's, what's, that's what kind of gets lost, is that, you know, you, you gave, they gave you something different. You put, you put Jericho, Benoit, and even Kurt Angle in this triple main event, and uh, they're giving a chance to some of the younger guys, and they finally went away from having Triple H and Rock in the main event. So uh, So let's get right down to it. For our first match of the night, you got the Hardy Boys teaming up with Lita to take on Test, Albert, and Trish Stratus. Uh, hell of an opener right here. The Hardys and Lita were extremely over. I think Dallas, Texas, is got, it's got to be up there with some of the most underrated crowds. I think they have a great history, you know, because of the Von Erichs and World Clash. There's just so much great history uh, in, uh, in from Dallas, Texas, you know, the Sportatorium and all that stuff. But yeah, yeah Hardy Boys are really over. Trish... You know, I do not think Trish is a natural heel. I, I really felt like it was very unnatural for her, but I, I would definitely say she did a good job. And um, she looked so hot here that it's, you know, very uh, distracting. I would definitely say that. But, you know, it's well documented how hot Trish Stratus was back in the day. But she definitely got a lot of good heat here, man. She, uh, Her and Lita were really going at it. So this is kind of like the first dimension of, the, uh, of that whole Trish and Lita feud. And then you got, um, you had Tess and Albert out there. I thought both Tess and Albert, underrated workers at the time. You saw some, you know, a lot of creative things here. So this was just a hot tag. It got great time. It got a great amount of time. It got like 13 minutes. You saw a triple, a triple suplex here. And uh, yeah, I just thought, you know, this just had a lot of uh, great, you know, crowd reaction here. And, uh, you know, the Hardys were just extremely over. So... Uh, everything here just came out really, really well. And then, uh, if the match ends with, you know, TNA going over and, and, and Trish kind of whipping, you know, Lita with a strap and that will play on to later on in the night. So next up, you got Taz actually taking on Al Snow 
with head. <laughs> they actually have Al Snow with head. And that's really the only time like the fans started reacting is when, is when they brought the head out here. Yeah, from a crowd reaction standpoint, this was disappointing. Like, it really was. Uh, I, I would definitely say Taz and Al Snow, they turned things around in, like, the last two minutes. Taz actually did win by submission. But, yeah, Taz and Al Snow, eventually they, be, they would become trainers uh, when they started out tough enough. You know, this might be one of the reasons why. I mean... In terms of knowing what both guys can do in the ring, both guys know what they're doing in the ring. But in terms of, you know, was Taz really, you know, getting the fans behind him? Did it really feel like a main eventer, you know, wrestling the second match of the night? It, it really didn't feel like that. So, but Taz got the big victory here. This is probably like the biggest push Taz ever got as a heel. This is when he started feuding with uh, Jerry Lawler the very next month. He would actually screw Rikishi later on in the night. All right, so next up, you got Perry Saturn. Actually teaming up with, um, uh, coming out there with Terry, Terry Runnels uh, to take on Eddie Guerrero with China uh, for the European Championship right here. So Eddie was actually wearing the Latino Heat shirt. Eddie and China were uh, extremely over right here. They got a great reaction. Um, you know, Perry Saturn actually got the win here with an elbow drop off the top rope. But uh, yeah. You know, you had you had a we really weird table bump with with Perry actually just pushing China through the announce table very lightly, but the announce table actually explodes, and uh, so yeah, you only have one more announce table left for for the big table bump later on in the night. But then uh, all of a sudden, uh, Terry takes advantage of uh, you know the referee being distracted by the China bump and helps Perry Saturn uh, defeat his friend. Uh, Eddie Guerrero right there. But yeah, good stuff between uh, Eddie and Perry. But, you know, you could argue it, it, it was something that could have been on television. Uh, next up, you got the APA, Bradshaw and Farouk, actually uh, challenging Edge and Christian for the Tag Team Championship. All right, so, you know, this, this was really a fun pay-per-view in terms of backstage segments, too. So Foley actually was the new commissioner at the time. And you know, Christian was trying to get out of the match by saying that he was sick. And it was funny because they had this shot of, of Christian just kind of, th you know, putting stuff in the toilet bowl to look like he was throwing up. And and uh, they had a shot of Foley actually peeping over the uh, the bathroom stall to see what he was doing. And you could actually see Christian just kind of like pouring like manure into the toilet bowl. So I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, you know, APA come out there. Uh, Edge and Christian are kind of, you know, shitting on the Dallas... Dallas sport teams, you know, trashing the Cowboys. I guess the Cowboys got in some, uh, you know, legal trouble at the time. And then uh, they were kind of, you know, you know, the Dallas Stars actually won the Stanley Cup finals in 1999. They're saying that they're not, you know, two-time champions. But, you know, who the hell is? It's tough to win back-to-back -back in, uh, in the NHL. But, yeah, you know, they were really just shitting on the Dallas um, – teams and then Bradshaw was really getting the fans behind him talking about how they won five Super Bowls and it's the home of the Stanley Cup champions and the fans really did get behind Bradshaw so good energy from the Bradshaw promo uh you know when, when Bradshaw was in Texas you know it wasn't hard for him to get the fans on his side and you know Farouk and Bradshaw they brought it man you had the fall away slam from the top rope from Bradshaw Farouk hits the spine buster you know they're pretty much rolling and then all of a sudden, Edge actually breaks up a pin and hits uh, Bradshaw with the tag team belt, and they get uh, disqualified. It kind of, yeah, kind of a cheap ending right there, and it's almost surprising that Foley didn't come out and you know restart the match or anything like that. But uh, but yeah, I, I guess the whole point of this was just to get Edge and Christian, you know, all that heat, you know, leading up to that SummerSlam TLC match. So I guess that was the point of that. But yeah, pretty underwhelming stuff because of the length, but. You know, the fans really did get behind the APA there. So let's move on to the next match. We've got Val Venus actually taking on Rikishi. This is a steel cage match for the Intercontinental Championship. So, yeah, a, a kind of a weird spot to have a steel cage match. Um, really is. I, I feel like you got enough firepower in this triple main event right here that I, I, I really felt like having the cage match was kind of a distraction. Uh, this was something that you could have put on Raw. 
I really feel like that. No video package. They didn't really show it. But uh, yeah, I remember back at King of the Ring, Val actually did attack Rikishi, you know, uh, hurt his injured shoulder. So he didn't win the King of the Ring. So they kind of continued this feud into a, a fully loaded right here. But yeah, really, the fans really, really weren't behind either guy here. You know, Rikishi was doing Samoa drops. Val Venus was doing clotheslines. Just really hard, vicious offense from both guys. Both, both guys worked extremely hard, but it, it almost seemed like the cage kind of, you know, hurt the crowd reaction here. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was. I think they definitely could have used the video package. Um, Trish actually did uh, come out to help Val Venus. You know, Trish was actually managing Val Venus at the time. So Trish is like working double duty. I was surprised at how much they actually had her do here, especially as a heel. But Lita came out, you know, got her revenge on Trish, started whipping her again just to get revenge. And that kind of opened the door up for, you know, all the chaos. And, uh, you know, Rikishi took advantage and actually does, does a splash off the middle of the cage uh, to Val Venus. But at the time, uh, Teddy Long is actually knocked out. Taz comes out and hits Rikishi with the camera so he can't escape the cage. So uh, Val, uh, Val Venus does go over there uh, to win the Intercontinental Championship. But yeah, got to give Rikishi credit. Obviously, he was inspired by, um, you know, Superfly Jimmy Snooker there. He even, you know, uh, paid homage to Jimmy, Jimmy Snooker in the, uh, the post-match promo. But overall, I just felt like the match was a chore to sit through. But you know, give Rikishi, you know, give Rikishi credit though. You know that 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 jump off the top of the cage, and then he actually took a bump off the hell in a cell. So it wasn't like Rikishi wasn't willing to be a team player by taking bumps. Uh, I just felt like you know maybe the crowd reaction here, and even at King of the Ring too. You know, the fans weren't into Rikishi at all when you go back to the King of the Ring finals with Kurt Angle. So that might might that might be one of the reasons why he was a candidate. To, uh, to be the one that ran over Stone Cold, and that's exactly what happened. Um, all right, so next up, we got The Undertaker taking on Kurt Angle. It's the first time these guys have met. Yeah, when I look back at this feud, I'm just like, man, this just, it just, just seems so, like, cartoonish looking back on it. Um, you know, Angle was, um, you know, celebrating one night with Milk, and he actually, like, hurt The Undertaker's uh, motorcycle. And then he had that great line where he said, I've been literally scared, afraid of a man that wears a bicycle, that rides a bicycle. Like, Undertaker, I'm no longer scared of you. But, yeah, you know what? Uh, Undertaker was just trying to act like he was way too cool, way too much of a badass. And uh, it almost felt like Taker really was annoyed by Kurt Angle. Like, it it almost kind of had the feeling like Taker really didn't respect Kurt as much as he would eventually, it, it definitely had that feel to it. I, I think Angle kind of rubbed people that way a lot, you know, that first year. I, I think even though he did win the gold medal, I, I just think he had a lot to prove in terms of, you know, even being a great in-ring worker. I think a lot of people just thought he was just there for the money or maybe there because, you know, it was just shortcut or whatever. But, yeah, you know, Angle did win King of the Ring. But after you win King of the Ring, you could kind of afford – uh, to get, you know, this was almost like a semi squash right here. I mean, it really was. So Angle wins King of the Ring, but he kind of, you know, he puts Undertaker over the very next month. It's kind of like they brought Angle down, you know, to reality here. But ultimately, it's a win win situation for Angle because he's going to main event SummerSlam. So it didn't really hurt him at all. But, you know, that's kind of the way it works. And, you know, Undertaker needed a big victory, too. You know, this is his first singles match back, you know, since being out that whole year after returning that Judgment Day. So. Yeah, you know, Angle really kind of, you know, took apart Undertaker's legs, you know, put him in some knee locks, just pretty methodical stuff. And then, you know, Taker basically gets the choke slam and the last ride. And yeah, you know, probably the worst match that they've, they've had together. It, it was just too short. It just, you know, it, it definitely did feel like, you know, uh, Undertaker was, you know, not really w- ready for a longer match. And Angle, I hate to say it, but Angle almost came off like he was, you know, still in the process of really grasping the business. So, yeah, I mean, I pretty much agree with everybody else. You know, this, it, even though this is part of the triple main event, you know, it's probably the worst Undertaker and Kurt Angle match. All right, now we get to the good stuff. We got Triple H actually taking on Chris Jericho, the last man standing match. I thought this was awesome. You know, this is my pick for my favorite last man standing match. I know it has a lot of competition, but I thought this was incredible stuff. Uh, obviously, this feud had been building up for a while. It goes back to when Jericho, you know, beat Triple H for the title 
with the fast count. Eventually, the decision was reversed, but it was just a great moment and just a great, uh, great moment for Jericho when he was awarded world ti- world champion back in uh, back in April. And then he had all these uh, promos with Stephanie, and you know Jericho uh, was talking trash to Vince and said, you know, you became a, a multi billionaire, and the only reason you did it is because you have a very small penis, and that your daughter is a slut. And and then Jericho actually kissed Stephanie at King of the Ring, as Steph was trying to get retaliation for the slut comment. And then uh, and then Jericho kept uh, you know screwing Triple H the whole month. He cost him the number one contender match. Uh, I, th- I think he actually. Screwed him in a match against the uh, the Brooklyn Brawler, so tri- Triple H actually got beat by the Brooklyn Brooklyn Brawler leading up to this match. But yeah, I mean a good build up. Um, you know, J- Jericho wanted it to be a last man standing match after taking a vicious sledgehammer shot to the ribs. So you had Jericho's ribs all taped up, and yeah, th- this was great stuff, man. It had a lot of tension here, and um, yeah, I just thought it was. You know, fast paced. I thought it was exciting. I thought it had energy. Uh, I, I, you know, Triple H. Um, this is probably the most Triple H ever bled in a match. Jericho actually clocked him with the steel chair, and he, you know, Triple H's face was a crimson mask, and it just just had a lot of good stuff here. You know, it, 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 this the story started out first with Triple H really just dominating it. And then Jericho got under his skin, with, you know, just doing like crotch chops and just a whole bunch of other stuff. And then obviously Steph got involved and, you know, this actually featured, you know, Triple H actually breaking up the walls of Jericho on Stephanie. But, you know, it, it's funny when you see that back, it's like, oh, man, don't tear your quad. But uh, but yeah, man, ju- just vicious stuff here. You know, the, the stuff with the sledgehammer when uh, I, I think tri- Triple H tried to swing the sledgehammer. Jericho ducks. The sledgehammer actually hits the ring post. You could just hear it thud. Triple H takes a backdrop off the steel steps. And, uh, yeah, just, you know, the, and the crowd was with him every step of the way. And, uh, yeah, I, I like the finish, though. You know, Jericho's trying to go for a line saw through a table. Triple H sees it coming and backdrop suplex. Uh, he backdrop suplexes. Jericho through the table and Triple H is able to get up all bloody after the 10 count and uh, yeah I mean it was a war it made Jericho look like he could go toe to toe with one of the best you know I would say Jericho probably wasn't quite in his prime yet but it was just a great way to show that Jericho was an ass kicker and uh, yeah you know great great little blow off to Triple H and Jericho's feud in 2000 I, I thought this dynamic really worked a lot better than the 2002 dynamic when Jericho was the heel. So yeah, it 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 it, it definitely all it everything came together here beautifully. And then next up we got The Rock actually taking on Chris Benoit with Shane McMahon for the WWF Championship. So if The Rock was disqualified, he was going to lose the title. All right, so the storyline was that Rock and Benoit the the feud had gotten so heated, you know, they were constantly fighting each other backstage in parking lots and in the locker room that you know Foley was worried that um that you know rock was going to take it too far so he, he wanted to kind of calm him down so if, if he got disqualified he was going to lose the belt and uh situation kind of backfired on foley as he actually had to come out uh after the match was over but yeah man I, i'll tell you what though underrated stuff I, I thought rock and benoit had a ton of chemistry this is by far the best match that they've had together this got a lot of time compared to their television matches this guy almost you know, three times as much time as a lot of the matches that they did have on television. And I would say one of the best video packages ever. They really went above and beyond building up Benoit here. I would tell you the Rock's promos, Benoit's promos, like I'm going to make the Rock squeal. I'm going to be crowned new champion because I'm the best technical wrestler. Then the Rock is like, well, technically the Rock is going to kick your monkey ass at fully loaded. You know, just stuff like that. I mean, just all all the, the sound bites from Rock and Benoit, came across great when they were edited in the video package and uh, the music and yo know, so check out that video package that's got to be in contention for a top 10 video package of all time when you go back to 2000 that that might have been the number one uh, you know better than any package that they've ever done and they need to do it because they needed to build Benoit up I think the Shane McMahon stuff I didn't think it was necessary but I get it you know Shane and Rock have been feuding you know for years ever since Rock turned babyface in 1999 but uh, you know, the whole thing with, with Benoit destroying The Rock's clothing, you know, before the match. I thought that was a little bit unnecessary. But, yo, bottom line was they built up Benoit as a great heel. You know, there was tons of Benoit sucks chance. So, uh, you definitely had to do that stuff. 
Uh, you know, keep in mind, Benoit is fresh out of WCW and, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, and they needed a new new main event. You know, you finally got a Triple H free main event. You know, you can't do Rock and Triple H every friggin' main event. So I, I, I thought this was cool. They did something creative, but at the same time, they give you a satisfying finish. I thought Benoit really br brought the best out of The Rock. He made The Rock work here. You know, Rock was, you know, becoming a pop icon at the time. You know, he was doing songs with Wyclef. He was on the uh, video music, um, the MTV Video Music Awards. So he was really, you know, the seeds were really planted for Hollywood rock at that time. But when he got into the ring, you know, Benoit was making him work for every single penny he was getting. And uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, rock, you know, he's a competitor, too. You know, Benoit brought it, but, you know, rock dissed it right back out to him. And, uh, you know, the, the ending was creative, though, because Shane, Shane actually s slams Earl Hebner with the chair. So Earl's actually like passed out and then Rock eventually puts Benoit in the crippler crossface. Benoit's, te you know, submitting. Uh, Earl Hebner sees it and he calls for the bell. And then all of a sudden they say and winner new WWF champion Chris Benoit by disqualification. So the referee actually disqualifies the Rock because the, the last time he saw, you know, when he woke up, he saw the Rock actually you know, going after Shane with the chair. So pretty creative booking. And then, you know, Foley comes out and says he he said it had to end by disqualification, but he did not see a disqualification. So he restarted the match. And uh, yeah, you know, it was good stuff. Even after they restarted the match, you know, great drama. You know, Benoit put him in the trifecta of uh, German suplexes, put him in the cross face. Rock, Rock's facial expressions, his eyes got really big gets to the rope, fights it off, and then hits uh, Benoit with the rock bottom. Uh, incredible main event. And du this double main event was just incredible. You know, one of the best last man standing matches ever. Uh, this is probably Chris Benoit's best match of 2000. I know the Jericho stuff is highly appreciated, and, you know, he had some other really, really good stuff. But, uh, yeah, I thought Rock and Benoit, not an accessible match at all, though. You know, that never been released on a DVD. You know, they released it on, you know, the best matches of 2000 VHS compilation, which... They used to sell that really cheap at uh, Suncoast back in the day. But, yeah, never really made its way onto a DVD. You know, when Benoit released his uh, DVD set, didn't even make it onto there. You know, they they really didn't, you know, go into depth with the three discs at that time. So, you know, maybe that's why. But, yeah, this is this is going to go down as an underrated gem, you know. Uh, you know, the, 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 the clash of styles here with Rock and Benoit, you know, two different personalities. It's sports entertainment versus Mr. Technical Wrestling. And for some reason, it just they just clicked. They had that chemistry. And, um, you know, they actually did talk about that in that Benoit documentary, but they, they didn't have the matches and extra. You know, that, that DVD is just loaded with so much. Um, you know, Super J Cup stuff. Maybe that's maybe that's why they they left it out. You know, there wasn't a, like a lot of WWE stuff on there. But yeah, I mean, I think the Triple H Jericho Last Man Standing match. That's that's got to be that. It's probably my favorite match of 2000. But I'll tell you what, this Rock and Benoit match is right behind it. So you got you got a double main event. I will put you know both matches at four and a half stars. I think this is an incredible. Double Bane event. The undercard is, it's pretty good. I would probably say the highlight of the undercard is actually the Hardys taking on Tess and Albert. And, uh, yeah, I was I was actually surprised at how, you know, ruthless. You know, Vince must have really been, you know, working with Trish a lot at that time. It, 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 it almost seemed like like Trish was under a microscope with, with how, you know, emotional and how, you know, vicious she was as a heel. I was, I was surprised at how well she did because, because I don't, I do not think Trish is like naturally, you know, a, a heel. So that's pretty much it guys. That's fully loaded 2000 Dallas, Texas. Uh, and I'm out. All right.